tearful testimony as Umar Zamir, the man accused of killing a Toronto police officer in 2021, takes the stand in his own defense. Good evening. Zamir gave his account of what he described as panicked moments in an underground parking garage the night Constable Jeffrey Northrup was killed in the line of duty. He also faced a tough cross-examination from prosecutors intent on punching holes in his version of events. CTV John Woodward was in the courtroom today and joins us now with more. John. Nathan, this is the first time we're hearing from Umar Zamir about his perspective of the events on that fateful night. We heard a tearful apology to Constable Northrup's family, and we heard hours of grueling cross-examination. That's Umar Zamir with his pregnant wife and son wandering downtown Toronto on Canada Day 2021. He testified Thursday that he was packing up his stroller in the parkade under Nathan Phillips Square and saw a man and a woman approach in a hurry. He said, his voice breaking down, I locked the car. The moment I did that, they started banging on the car. The banging was so loud, my son started crying. I thought I'd just go straight to get away from them and get out of there. The moment I moved forward, this dark gray van came out of nowhere and cut us off. I was like, what is this? Previously, it was just a man and woman on foot banging on my car, and now it's a whole gang. The man and the woman, Constable Jeffrey Northrup, and his partner, Sergeant Lisa Forbes, both in plain clothes. They had been diverted to City Hall to investigate a stabbing. The dark gray van, an unmarked police car that had swooped in to support Northrup and Forbes. That van would follow Zamir out of the parkade, slamming into his car, arresting him at gunpoint. One officer punched him in the face, a dramatic arrest that saw other drivers flee. Zamir said he saw no one in front of him and believed he had just run over a speed bump. An officer pointed to the blood on the car and he said he realized it was a person and prayed the person would be okay. I was horrified. To this day, I think about that. He said then in tears as he spoke to Northrup's family. I didn't mean to hurt your dad. I just wish I could bring him back. I just wish all of this didn't happen. In his cross-examination, the Crown attorney said the grainy video of the incident showed Zamir's car out of frame for nine seconds more than enough time for him to identify the badge that other footage from the night shows Sergeant Lisa Forbes wearing. Her badge was always visible, the Crown said. No, ma'am, I didn't see any badge, Zamir responded. Officers have testified they did identify themselves as police. Zamir said he never heard them say that word. Zamir is facing a first-degree murder charge, though the judge may give the jury other options. There could be a chance of a second-degree murder uh, charge being left with the jury to consider or a manslaughter charge. In testimony, Zamir said he wished the timing had been even slightly different, five minutes earlier or five minutes later, so that none of this had happened. The Crown challenged Zamir's excuse on the speed bump, saying Northrop is a 300-pound officer. Surely Zamir would have heard him or seen him or even felt him. Zamir denied that, saying if he had seen Northrop, he would have tried to go in another direction, saying all he was trying to do was get away. Reporting live from 361 University, I'm John Woodward. Michelle, back to you. Thank you, John. Still ahead, a man is dead, two others injured following an overnight shooting in the city's West End. We'll have reaction from neighbors reeling from the violence. Coming up. He was a Hall of Fame football player and an infamous accused double murderer. O.J. Simpson has died at the age of 76. His family took to social media to announce his passing after a battle with cancer. CTV's Joy Malvin has more. From football hero to Hollywood fame and fortune. O.J. Simpson, as you've never seen him before. O.J. Simpson had it all. His stunning rise and fall captivated America. Who can forget the savage murders of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, their rocky marriage allegations of abuse. She and a friend, Ron Goldman, were found stabbed outside Simpson's Los Angeles home. 911, what are you reporting? This is, this is AC. I have OJ in the car. He's still alive, but he got a gun to his head. On the run, networks carried Simpson's stunning slow motion car chase live. Eventually surrendering, Simpson was arrested and charged with their brutal murders. Ron and Nicole were butchered. In what was called the trial of the century, nearly 100 million watched, riveted by every detail. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. The verdict divided the country. Defendant Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder. Along racial grounds, celebrations erupted. Others were left in shock. You know, it was a very divisive case. People hated him, hated me for representing him. 
Um, it was divided along racial lines. Nobody does it better than her. O.J. trying to recapture the glory of his past, ran into more legal trouble. Ordered to pay the Goldman family $33 million in a civil trial, Simpson never paid them a cent, but ended up spending serious time in prison in 2007 for kidnapping and armed robbery in Nevada. And I didn't know I was doing anything illegal. I thought I was confronting friends and retrieving my property. Paroled after nine years, once a legend, a superstar, a beloved idol, Thank you to all of people. whose fall from grace is an American tragedy. Joy Malbin, CTV News, Washington. And we have more news in a moment, but first, here's a live look outside tonight. A soggy Thursday for us with more periods of rain expected tomorrow. Jessica Smith is here with a look at the current conditions. A wet day, Jessica. It is a low down on the Texas low. It's sitting over us right now, bringing significant amounts of rain. We're likely to see our monthly rainfall total by the end of the day today, and we're still not really even into the middle of the month. This is going to be an all day rain affair today and into the day tomorrow. We get pockets of some breaks, but we're not done with the chance of active weather just yet. All of the rain prompting a special weather statement right across southern Ontario. Rainfall warnings to the north, and by the time it's all said and done, we could see an additional 40 millimeters. This always causes ponding and pooling on the road, so just be careful as you make your way out and about tonight and into the day tomorrow. Temperature wise across southern Ontario, mild through Windsor, they're sitting at 16. We're kind of around that 9 to 11 degree range for the most part in and around the Golden Horseshoe. Between the islands and Pearson between 10 and 13, but a breezy kind of easterly flow to the winds. Tonight, mild with a risk of thunderstorms. Coming up, a full look at your long range forecast right now. Back over to Michelle and Nathan. Jessica, business owners and residents in the city's West End are shaken following Toronto's latest homicide. One man was killed and two others sent to hospital after a triple shooting in the early morning hours. Just the latest on what neighbors say has been a rash of violent incidents. CTV's Mike Walker is live from Queen Street West in Portland to bring us the latest details. Mike. Nathan, Michelle, residents describe hearing multiple gunshots as bars were letting out here in the Queen and Portland area early this morning. A 30-year-old man is dead. The shooter remains at large. Forensic investigators searching for evidence along a stretch of Queen Street West after a deadly triple shooting overnight. The eruption of gunfire startling residents out of bed. There was like two that were like kind of like bam, bam, and then it was like, a, seems like there was a pause, and then there was three that went boom, 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 like faster. Police say the shooting happened outside an establishment just after 2.30 this morning on the south side of Queen Street between Portland and an alley. As bullets flew, people from nearby bars and restaurants ran for cover. One of the victims, a 30-year-old man, died in hospital. Anytime you have somebody with a, a firearm and they're opening, openly shooting that firearm in the middle of a, a crowded roadway, in the city of Toronto, there's obviously concerns with regards to firearm safety and violence in the city. Investigators say the other two victims, a 36-year-old woman and a 33-year-old man, were taken to hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. The suspect fled the scene in a dark-colored two-door sedan. Investigators are still trying to determine whether the shooting was targeted. I do believe targeted, but to what extent, I don't know yet. I don't know the relationship between the parties. There might have been an interaction that happened earlier. I'm not sure yet. It's just too early for me to know. This violent incident has left business owners and area residents reeling. It's always alarming. It's probably not people from our neighborhood. We always avoid walking right past these couple of places just because, you know, there have been incidents like this in the past. It's scary as a resident. Lots of families here. here. And I'm just worried. I'm really worried about the people around and how they can uh, walk with gun in their pocket. Sahar Del Moradi opened her cafe about five months ago and says there has been a rash of violent and gun-related incidents during that time. Two bullet holes can still be seen in an apartment window above her business from a separate shooting. Another time, I saw two men, two groups of people. They had fight. They had gun, and so it coming to be usual. Police say they have notified the victim's family, but are not yet releasing their identity. And just moments ago, police releasing the victim's identity, 30-year-old Ibrahim Abdi Karim of Toronto. There is still no suspect description as investigators continue to appeal for witnesses. Reporting live, I'm Mike Walker. Michelle, back to you. Thank you, Mike. 
A man in his 20s is dead after he was hit by a pickup truck this morning in Brampton. Just after 7, emergency crews responded to the crash at Mississauga Road in Williams Parkway. The victim was transported to hospital and later died of his injuries. Police say the driver remained on scene and provided dash camera footage of the incident. The Peel Police Major Collision Bureau is now investigating. The provincial government is facing questions on next steps to declare intimate partner violence an epidemic in Ontario. The Premier spoke about the issue for the first time today, and our Queen's Park Bureau Chief Siobhan Morris joins us live with the details. Siobhan. Well, the Premier revealed this morning that he was on the phone last night with a man from Sault Ste. Marie who lost four family members to intimate partner violence in the fall. Doug Ford talked about how heartbreaking stories like this are, and he wants to make sure that any changes the government makes really have teeth. It was a moment that brought Kate Alexander to tears. The government backing a bill that would call intimate partner violence an epidemic. One of the most pleasant surprises of the last three years. I honestly haven't had many from this government uh, with the failing of my attempted murder case. In 2021, Alexander's ex-boyfriend allegedly tried to kill her. The charges thrown out over court delays linked to understaffing. She sees value in declaring an epidemic. It means that we can actually move on this instead of just, you know, passing bills intermittently or not doing anything at all. But now the opposition accuses the government of trying to muddy the waters and backtrack on a commitment that they made to the 200 plus people here yesterday. The bill has been sent to committee to have survivors and support workers weigh in. I want to make sure that uh, it's not just the spirit of, uh, of, uh, of passing it. It is actually making sure that the uh, the programs and services match what uh, what uh, uh, victims and providers are asking for. We have already been speaking for years, for decades. She points to 86 recommendations from an inquest into the murders of three women in Renfrew County as a roadmap for change. We don't need to spend millions of dollars and a bunch of years uh, researching and looking for the information. The information is already there. With calls for more cash and other support in the judicial system and supportive housing. They are turning women away because they do not have enough room for them when they are initially leave. It's not a lack of money. We're pouring money into it. The Premier defends extending the conversation on intimate partner violence. There's one thing to pour money past legislation, but let's, let's put some teeth into this. It's really heart-wrenching when this, this happens to, to families. The Mr. Ford has no choice. Families like Brian Sweeney's, his daughter Angie, and her three kids were killed in the fall. The alleged gunman, an ex. You want to talk about a hard conversation. You talk to a father that lost his daughter, his kids. Oh, my goodness. It just rips your heart out. It's a kind of pain Alexander stresses is preventable. We need the government to actually act on this so we can save lives. One of the things Kate Alexander says she doesn't want to see is any more parties blaming each other. She says addressing intimate partner violence shouldn't be a partisan issue. Reporting live from Queen's Park, I'm Siobhan Morris. Nathan, back to you. Thank you, Siobhan. Toronto police are keeping up the search for a suspect in a stabbing at Union Station a month ago. Investigators shared a new image of the man they're looking for. This suspect is wanted for allegedly stabbing a man who bumped into him on a train platform on March 9th. He was last seen on Bay, headed toward Lakeshore. If you have any information, you're asked to contact police or Crime Stoppers. The TTC board voted unanimously today to request the city's Auditor General investigate the, quote, systemic causes of last year's derailment on Line 3. What was it about the, the checks and balances in the TTC's maintenance and record-keeping systems that were perhaps missed, uh, were not followed, or were maybe not... Um, uh, strong enough to prevent this type of accident from happening. I think that's really what we're seeking the Auditor General's assistance with. King, the vote seeking you. assistance from the AG comes after the TTC me? board received reports on the July 2023 derailment. It took the SRT out of service months earlier than planned and five people were hurt. The TTC says the incident was caused by defective bolts. Transit advocates and unions argue more answers are needed to help restore public trust. We do not feel people feel that there's full transparency regarding what's going on with the TTC. Whether it's in a commissioner's meeting or any other circumstance, it shouldn't take the union or other people highlighting incidents in order for it to be made known put out to the public. As transit workers, we always report defects, we always report hazards, we always report issues. It's management that does not actually put that out there and try to get these things addressed. 
The TTC has said the safety of its customers and employees is of paramount concern and previously indicated it would fully cooperate with the Auditor General's office if it opens an investigation into the Line 3 derailment. And sticking with the TTC, a union representing electrical skilled trades workers could go on strike as soon as Monday, April 22nd. This comes as QP Local 2 and the board try to reach a new collective agreement. The union represents subway signal and streetcar overhead maintainers, among other things. TTC CEO Rick Leary said his ultimate goal is a deal that avoids job action and service disruptions. He pledged to keep customers and employees up to date on negotiations. It was a less than fun experience today at Woodbine Mall's Fantasy Fair after the Ferris wheel at the amusement park stalled, trapping 11 people on the ride. Fire crews say they received a call to assist. At around 2.30 this afternoon, all 11 people were rescued from the 50-foot ride, and uh, platoon chief Chris Rowland says the issue was caused by the brakes setting, halting the Ferris wheel. The people that were trapped were never in any danger. Uh, the Ferris wheel, the brake set, and it would move. Uh, and it just enabled us to, uh, by shutting off the power to the Ferris wheel, it allowed the gravity feed to bring people down, and we were able to remove them safely. Chief Rowland says there are no injuries. Coming up, residents of Danforth and Woodbine are less than impressed with the mess on the street. The mayor's response to the frustration still ahead. First time home buyers are the focus of yet another pre budget announcement by the federal government in Toronto today. Canadians work really hard to be able to buy and afford their homes. And it is only fair that mortgage lenders should help Canadians do everything they can to afford their homes at a time of higher interest rates. The Liberals will allow 30-year amortization periods on insured mortgages, but only for first-time homebuyers purchasing newly built homes. It will take effect August 1st. Also, the amount first-time homebuyers can withdraw from RRSPs to purchase a home is being nearly doubled to $60,000. The change is effective as of next Tuesday, which is Budget Day. A new poll suggests many Canadians feel the current housing market is out of reach. The CIBC survey found 76% of respondents say they can't enter the market. 55% say they could only afford a home with an inheritance or gift from their family. Overpriced markets and the inability to save for a down payment are to blame. Around half of variable and fixed rate mortgage holders are also cutting back on everyday expenses to pay for their loans. Meanwhile, the parliamentary budget officer says Canada would need to build 1.3 million additional homes by 2030 to eliminate the country's housing gap. A new report looks at how many more are required to restore the vacancy rate to the historical average. It says an estimated 181,000 more homes are needed each year. The Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation says Canada needs to construct 3.5 million additional homes by 2030 to restore affordability to 2003-04 levels. A new survey indicates most Canadians think the federal government is overspending. 59% of respondents to the Angus Reid poll say the Liberals are spending too much. 18% believe spending is within an acceptable range, and 8% say the government is underspending. Among those surveyed, the largest proportions identified overspending in foreign aid, Indigenous reconciliation, environmental initiatives, and government services. A massive missile and drone attack destroyed one of Ukraine's largest power plants today. The plant was the biggest energy supplier to three regions, including Kyiv. It was struck numerous times, destroying the transformer turbines and generators. The plant provided power to three million customers, but none lost power because the grid was able to compensate. Other plants were damaged, part of a renewed Russian campaign targeting energy infrastructure. There are no reports of any casualties. In the Middle East, dozens of aid trucks entered the Gaza Strip today. The crucial supplies were transported through the Rafah crossing. The deliveries arrived amid international pressure on Israel to allow more humanitarian aid into the besieged territory. Israel promised the U.S. it would dramatically ramp up the amount of supplies being admitted in exchange for continued support for the war. But over the last few days, U.N. workers said there has been only a slight increase in aid. France's Prime Minister has begun a three-day visit to Canada. He spoke about an issue that's getting a lot of attention in this country right now. 
It's a huge challenge for us right now. We are, see we are seeing clear uh, interference coming especially from uh, Russia. We are seeing it on the social uh, media. We are seeing uh, it uh, in many places. Gabriel Attal says attempted foreign interference requires countries to keep their citizens informed. Last month, the French government revealed it was experiencing attacks of unprecedented intensity. Attal and the prime minister also talked about wildfires, trade, climate change and clean energy. A U.S. Space Force mission blasted off from a base in California today. Ignition. And a lift off the Falcon 9. Go USS F-62. Go SpaceX. This rocket carried a satellite into low Earth orbit. It will provide weather intelligence for military operations. This is SpaceX's second national security mission of the year and the third launch of the first stage booster that is being used. Commuters in Australia were forced to put up with some serious horseplay during their evening commute. A racehorse that escaped from a nearby stable wandered into a train station in Sydney. The animal went for a trot along the platform. Passengers were startled, but no one was hurt. The horse was eventually reunited with its owner. The train network's operator posted a message on social media to remind customers that the chances of a horse boarding your train are very low, but never zero. Coming up, why the mess? A corner of the city sparking outcry over its upkeep. Residents dismayed by the neglect. We take their concerns to the top. And I'm Pat Foran. Coming up on Consumer Alert, it's tax time and there are many scams going around. Criminals are calling people pretending to be with the CRA, saying they need help to stop money laundering. Scarborough woman just got scammed out of $86,000. I'll have my reports just ahead. And the rain not going anywhere as we near the end of the week. So getting the kids ready for school and yourself ready for your day tomorrow. Pack the umbrella. Plus, we're also looking at a really gusty southwesterly wind that will add to the challenging commute for many as we head in towards the day tomorrow. Coming up, a full look at your long range forecast. And stay with us. We've got another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV. There are many scams related to taxes, refunds in the Canada Revenue Agency that usually happen around this time of year. In one scam, criminals call you pretending to be with the CRA, asking for your help to stop money laundering operations. Our Pat Foran has tonight's Consumer Alert. Pat. Thanks, Michelle and Nathan. A Scarborough woman got a call out of the blue from someone claiming to be with the CRA. The caller knew her name and where she banked. She thought she was helping in a government investigation, but was scammed out of $86,000. The scamming is very advanced right now than our parents. And Jira asked us to use only her first name as she comes to terms with being caught in the CRA investigator scam. She got a call from someone who claimed her bank accounts were being used in a money laundering operation. It is from the investigation department and it is a 24-hour notice order by the government body. Uh, so we are going to investigation on you. And Jira was told the RCMP was involved and she had no choice but to cooperate or criminals would steal her money. I thought that they are helping, right? It means they want to froze other eight accounts and they want to protect me. She was told to make multiple withdrawals from her accounts at two banks and was directed to put the money in a Bitcoin machine. She was told it would be returned when the investigation was complete. The first bank they told go to inside the bank. Don't tell the bank person anything because you, you are like high level of investigation. Over a period of three days, she drained her bank accounts and lines of credit of $86,000. And Jira says she was convinced she was helping the Canadian government until her husband and friends convinced her it was all a scam. You are a big scammer. Toronto police is coming to catch up you. So don't call anymore. We're not going to threaten you or use aggressive language. Revenue Canada says if you ever get a call from someone claiming to be with the CRA, you should call CRA directly to confirm they're legitimate. And you can always hang up and call us back through our individual inquiries line and say, I've got this contact. Here's this person who's been trying to call me, who I've just spoken to. Can you verify who they are? I'm crying with the bank. I'm crying with other things. And Jira filed a police report and contacted her banks, but so far she's on the hook for the missing funds. The person who called me, he knows my name. He knows how many accounts I have. He gave the information that way.
And also be careful if you get texts or emails claiming to be from Revenue Canada saying your tax refund is ready. Don't click on links in these messages. It's a scam to try and get your personal information. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. Well, we can be sure the May flowers are coming because we're getting the <laughs> April showers. Yeah, it started early this morning. It pretty much continued all day, and it just seems like it's not going to stop. <laughs> and it's not. <laughs> it continues. This Texas low has kind of parked itself over us, and this is a multi-day event. We get a short break starting into the weekend before another round of rain comes through. But for all the, the gardeners out there, the producers out there, I'm sure this rain is much needed after a winter with not a lot of snow. Weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. The rain has been constant all day from start to finish. Winds have picked up here and there. And then as we head into the early evening, we also watch for the risk of a couple of thunderstorms. Why not add a little extra in there? We've already seen this Texas low bring some significant rain, prompting special weather statements almost everywhere. We're sitting at 16 right now through Windsor, 13 here in the city, 12 through Ottawa, even northern Ontario. They're benefiting from some of this warmth, a bit of a ridge in the jet stream, bringing warm southern air really over the entire province. Heading into this evening, really no cool down. We're sitting at 9. We should be at 2 for this time of year. Kingston should be at 0. They'll be at 12. It is relatively mild, and we're watching for this risk of thunderstorms really any time from now through to the early morning hours tomorrow, getting really heavy through parts of northern Ontario. Into the day tomorrow, fairly seasonal. Uh, a little cooler down towards London, over through Goderidge, Owen Sound. But for the most part, we're holding on pretty close to those seasonal values. The bulk of this low really is pushing through as we head through the end of the day today, into the day tomorrow. And those dotted lines, those troughs, those are extensions off of that main low that will still bring the chance of showers as we head into the day tomorrow. Again, as we head through the early evening, we're watching for those yellows, those oranges. That's the thunderstorm activity to push its way through. Getting into the start of the day tomorrow, soggy for that commute to work. We do, however, get a little bit of a break in the GTA as we head into the early afternoon, but northern Ontario really gets hit with heavy rain and even a rain-snow mix. Getting into our Friday night, into our Saturday, as temperatures drop a little, we're looking at the likelihood of some wet snow. So don't let the blue uh, concern you too much. We're not looking at a significant snowfall event for us here in the GTA, but it is going to be a little messy. Getting into our Saturday morning, a lot of this pushes out, and we do get some late-day sunshine. So it's not a wash of a weekend by any means, but it isn't going to be perfectly clear either. An additional 16 millimeters by the time we get into about the lunch hour tomorrow. All said and done, by the time we get to the end of the day Friday, we're looking at almost the month's worth of rain in just the first few weeks of the month of April. Getting into the day tomorrow, very seasonal for the most part throughout the day. Your Saturday, again, not terrible. Cloudy in the morning, some sun in the afternoon. A weaker low comes through and brings showers for your Sunday. 15 for the high, 2 for the low. Monday, Tuesday, fantastic. T-shirt temperatures, dare I say. We are watching for some midweek showers, but overall not looking too shabby to spend some time outside. I'll send things over to Nathan and Michelle. Thank you, Jess. Clutter on one city street corner is angering some East End residents. CTV's Beth McTonnell has more on the community concern near Danforth and Woodbine. At Danforth and Woodbine, there are concerns, in particular at the northeast corner. A woman is living inside the bus shelter. She didn't want to appear on camera, but told CTV News she's over 60 and lost her apartment two and a half years ago, staying here since February. Next to her is a city trash bin. Recently, pictures were posted to Facebook with the bin open, trash spilling on the sidewalk with the caption the corner is being sadly neglected. On the Danforth itself, it's usually pretty clean, but depending where you go in the neighborhood or even down Woodbine here, there's the garbage cans and sometimes they're all like all over the place. Brayden Appleton walks by here almost every day. He says before the woman arrived, the bus shelter was used by other homeless people. The TTC says it services the night bus and shuttles, but is on city property. Appleton takes CTV around the block, showing graffiti on Woodbine, a beaten up truck that hasn't moved in months, and another trash bin on Strathcona. Hey, but if you look, it's still open. Tidier now, but he says it's often a mess. So often street furniture is either broken or it's being misused. Paul Nielsen says a big part of the problem, fixing problems quickly, is explaining the exact spot with 311, be it a trash bin or a bench or something else. His idea for the city to install QR codes so people can quickly use a phone to report the precise problem and its location. Having good street furniture, having a sense of order in the community is good because 
it's, a, it's part of the livability of our city. We want to live here in a home that we enjoy, not having to stumble over broken things or being frustrated by broken things all the time. Toronto's mayor admits the city could do better on cleanliness. Not enough, I agree. Uh, and I've taken some of those photos and asked our staff what they can do. We are looking at different ways of uh, picking up garbage. The woman tells CTV the city is helping her, but she doesn't want to go in a traditional shelter. Like many, Appleton isn't sure what the best move is. Honestly, don't know. It doesn't really bug me or anything, so I'm just kind of a let it and like leave it, let live guy and guy. As the woman's well-being and cleanliness around trash bins are both important. Beth McDonnell, CTV News. Also tonight, releasing the stress and challenges of life through the power of song and the movement of dance. World Parkinson's Day celebrated at Young Dundas Square. Today is World Parkinson Day, and it also marks the launch of a new song by Canadian music icon Martha Johnson of Martha and the Muffins. CTV's Pauline Chan met Martha today to talk about her music and life with Parkinson's. <laughs> It's been 44 years since Echo Beach made Martha and the Muffins a household name. And Martha Johnson has continued to write and record while living with Parkinson's disease for the past 23 years. The symptoms are quite uh, mild at the beginning. It took uh, quite several years and, and eventually I couldn't... Um, we couldn't go out as a, as a band anymore to play live. But she was in front of a crowd today talking about her latest song, Slow Emotion. It's about, and Slow Emotion is uh, asking people to be kind and thoughtful and empathy rather than symp sympathy. I think that, that it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a good message. It really brings a sense of community, um, a sense of anything is still possible, um, even with the diagnosis. Karen Lee of Parkinson Canada says the number of Canadians living with Parkinson's disease is expected to rise to 300,000 in the next 10 years. Right now there's about 100,000 people who live with Parkinson's, but we expect the number to grow. And we don't really know why. It could be related to risk of aging. And as we know, we have an aging population, and the risk of Parkinson's is related to aging. I'm waiting for the sun to run. Sarah Robichaud, founder of Dancing with Parkinson's, led the crowd as they danced to the new song. My philosophy is come as you are. Everyone who walks into that room or comes on to Zoom with us is an artist. There are no patients. Singing has become more difficult for Martha, but a video has been made about recording the song, and her co-writer, Fabio Dwyer, along with all the backup singers, are all people living with Parkinson's. As for the future, Martha says she still has lots of music in her back pocket, and not all of it about Parkinson's. Oh yeah, definitely. There's a lot more, lot more songs. Pauline Chan, CTV News. The Artist Project is returning to Toronto for the next four days. The exhibit features works from over 250 independent artists at the Better Living Centre. The space is designed to spark conversations and foster a personal connection with art. Along with thousands of artworks, there are also large-scale installations and tours. The province has announced plans to widen a stretch of highway in the eastern GTA to support growing levels of traffic. The Ministry of Transportation says it will invest $12 million towards expanding Highway 7, specifically between Reeser Road in Markham and Brock Road in Pickering. The roadway would expand from two to four lanes. The funds will support preliminary work and an environmental assessment. Mayor Olivia Chow was joined by the province's energy minister as they turned their focus to Toronto's longer-term electricity needs. As more and more people are drawn to Toronto, we must build the infrastructure to support them. We need more power. The province says the independent electricity system operator will gather public input and then decide how Toronto's surging energy needs will be met in the future. Officials say Toronto's peak energy demand is expected to double by the year 2050. While a dispute over music rights on TikTok continues, Taylor Swift's songs are back on the social media platform.
It's not clear what kind of deal may have been reached to get Swift's music back onto TikTok. It had been removed along with the music of other artists distributed by Universal Music Group. The two companies have been clashing over compensation levels. After making a cultural splash with Barbie, Margot Robbie's planning to put a new twist on a different toy franchise. Robbie became the face of Barbie as its star, but she was also a producer on the highest grossing movie of 2023. Her company is now teaming up with Lionsgate to make a Monopoly movie. The project is expected to be live action and will, of course, be based on the beloved real estate themed board game. No other details on the potential plot have been released. The charges translate to theft in any language. LA Dodgers star Shohei Otani's former interpreter is accused of stealing $16 million to pay off gambling debts. Details after the break. Remembering a Canadian hero on the 44th anniversary of Terry Fox's Marathon of Hope, we'll speak to Daryl Fox about his brother's ongoing legacy. CP24 Breakfast, where Toronto gets its everything every morning. Updating our top stories, Umar Zamir, the man accused in the death of a Toronto police officer, testified about the panic he felt as he tried to escape a chaotic scene in an underground parking garage. Breaking down on the stand. O.J. Simpson, as you've never seen him before. Former football star O.J. Simpson is dead. His rise to stardom and criminal fall captivated America, charged and acquitted of double murder. The man at the center of the trial of the century was 76. There was like two that were like, kind of like bam, bam. And then it was like, a, seemed like there was a pause. And then there was three that went boom, 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 like faster. Neighbors and business owners are shaken after a triple shooting in the Queen and Portland Street area in the West End overnight left one man in his 30s dead, two other people injured. And remember to keep up to date day and night through our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca, and by downloading the CTV News app. And if you have a news tip, photos, or video breaking news, let us know. Amazon has helped to demolish retailers around the world and revolutionize how we buy and sell things. Investors think the web giant still has lots of growth ahead. Andrew Bellabian and Bloomberg brings us the latest in business. Hello there. Shares in Amazon.com hit a new record high today. The e-commerce and cloud computing giant stock topped $189 US to beat the previous intraday high set in July of 2021. The shares have been slower than other tech giants to return to 2021 highs. So Amazon pledged to slash costs to boost profits. The company is betting heavily on artificial intelligence. Britain's antitrust watchdog says it's concerned over a, quote, interconnected web of AI deals by the likes of Google, Apple, Microsoft and Amazon. On the markets, the Canadian dollar changed hands at 73.09 US cents, down a fraction. WTI oil, North America's benchmark, was at $84.45, down 99 cents. Western Canadian Select Oil, the Alberta benchmark, has been trading at $70.88, up 47 cents. And the TSX Composite Index ended the session at 22,110.11, down just over 89 points. That's the latest in business. I'm Andrew Bell of BNN Bloomberg. Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. The head of BCE appeared before a parliamentary committee on Canadian heritage today. MPs wanted answers from Mirko Bibic. At issue, jobs the company cut earlier this year. CTV's Adrian Gobriel covering the appearance today and has more on what was said. Following Bell Canada's most recent layoffs, backlash was swift from members of parliament, even the prime minister. And today, Bell's CEO, Mirko Bibic, testified on Parliament Hill. Since I became CEO in 2020, Bell invested, Bell Media has invested more than $1 billion in capital to better serve our viewers. And this is on top of the almost $1.7 billion a year we invest in content. Yet despite these massive investments, CTV conventional stations lost more than $180 million last year, and Bell Media loses more than $40 million a year on news alone. 
In February, Bell Canada Enterprises, Inc., the parent company of CTV News, announced it was cutting 4,800 positions from its workforce, including multiple CTV newscasts and selling 45 of its 103 radio stations. Ahead of today's hearing in Ottawa, Bell issued this press release titled Facts Matter, saying in part that Canada's traditional media sector is in crisis due to changing consumer habits, technological disruptions, shifting advertiser demand, and vigorous competition from foreign streamers and global web giants. One communications professor believes Bell Media has a moral and regulatory responsibility to deliver, fund and sustain a robust news division from coast to coast to coast. We're losing a lot of really good journalists who provide an essential function within not just Canadian democracy, but any democracy. This cuts to the core of what we need in a democratic society. During his opening remarks today, Bibic told the committee that Bell has paid nearly $2 billion in regulatory fees, while streaming giants like Netflix, Disney, Amazon and others haven't paid a cent. That report from Adrian Gobriel. Shohei Otani's former interpreter has been charged with federal bank fraud. It is alleged Ipe Mitsuhara stole more than $16 million from the superstar to cover gambling bets and debts. Prosecutors say he abused the trust placed in him and exploited the language barrier to plunder a bank account that only he could access. Mitsuhara was fired by the L.A. Dodgers after the scandal broke last month. This is the day fans of golf have been waiting for. The Masters is underway. Setting up for the big fade, trying to use the wind. Oh, is that... Tiger Woods was among a number of late starters after tee off times were pushed back by some bad weather this morning. The five time winner of the green jacket may run out of daylight and have to complete his round tomorrow. Four Canadians are playing at Augusta National. Listowel's Corey Connors leads that group. He's in the clubhouse at minus two. The Maple Leafs are going for a fourth straight win when they host New Jersey tonight. Drops it back for Brody for Riley. Riley shoots. Allen save. Rebound. Robertson scores. Toronto sits in third place in the Atlantic Division, three points behind Florida, but the Buds have a game in hand. Austin Matthews has 66 goals with four games left to reach 70. Toronto's Zach Eadie has been named the top men's college basketball player in the United States for a second time. Eadie led the NCAA in scoring and powered Purdue to the national championship game, which they lost to UConn. The 7'4 center joins Virginia's Ralph Sampson, who won the John R. Wooden Award in 1982 and 83. Also tonight, separated by injury, a pair of swans reunite in heartwarming fashion. The story behind these viral lovebirds just ahead. And a reminder, the CTV News at 6 podcast is available as a download every weeknight. And a special what's good to those of you listening to the newscast live on News Talk 1010. The internet is swooning over a pair of Toronto lovebirds, more specifically swans. A video capturing the reunion of the couple is melting hearts. CTV Sean Leethong has the story. It may be hard to see that these swans really do love each other, but we do know. Trumpeter swans actually mate for life. This pair known as Mango and Charlotte spend their days side by side until last week when Mango suddenly became injured, prompting a call to the Toronto Wildlife Centre. And we were surprised to see how much blood was on this bird, so we were very concerned. With blood on his wing, Mango appeared to be in distress, forcing Andrew White and his rescue team to spring into action, bringing the swan to the rehab centre, but separating Mango from Charlotte. The cut was on Mango's bill. The blood compromised the waterproofing of his feathers. Luckily, in just two days, Mango was on the men. Charlotte had been alone for two days, not knowing where her partner could be. The exciting, heartwarming part about this story is we took a video of the reunion of this male swan going back to his mate. There's Y37 coming out. So when Mango was returned to the shore, Charlotte was just a few meters away. After a few cautious seconds, emotion took over. <laughs> Mango and Charlotte reunited in a way that may seem familiar to so many. The excitement to be back together, it's almost, it's on a human level that we can almost connect with us. Animals have feelings too, and you can see this in this video. 
together again and safe, allowing these two to get back to their lives. And since last week, the Toronto Wildlife Centre has been keeping track and say that their time apart seems to have sparked Mango and Charlotte to start a family. So uh, we're expecting some, some young swans in the not too uh, far future. Now the two are side by side again and life seems to be back to normal. That is until the little ones come later this spring. Sean Lee Thong, CTV News. Shout out to Mango and Charlotte. I know. Oh, so <laughs> reunited and it feels so, so good. good. Oh, thank you so much. For <laughs> 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 I would have finished that by myself, but I'm glad you joined it. Uh, it's a beautiful day for the swans. If they like the rain and all the water out there, it continues tonight. It continues tomorrow. We get a little bit of a break Saturday and then it continues on Sunday. So just keep the rain gear handy, regardless of what you're doing throughout the next kind of three to four days. Still watching for heavier showers to this evening, even the risk of some pop up thunderstorms. And that special weather statement remains in place likely until at least tomorrow morning. And we still have some rainfall warnings in parts of northern Ontario. By the time this is all said and done, we could see a month's worth of rain before the month is all said and done. Temperature wise, still quite mild, even with all the active weather heading into the day tomorrow. A slight break Saturday, a few light showers Sunday. But hey, Monday, Tuesday, I'm looking at you, 16, 17, and a whole lot of sunshine. Thank you, Jess. Be sure to join. Heather Buss tonight at 11 for CTV National News, followed by Natalie Johnson with our next local newscast at 11.30. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Jessica Smith and all of us at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a good night.